said, I am uh, from, uh, from TapJoy. I'm the director of app services there. And this is going to be a three-part talk. The first part, I promise you, will be short. That's where I tell you who I am and why you should listen to me. You can feel free to ignore that if you like. Uh, the second part is going to be on general game design, mostly how to get a project uh, started and launched uh, on kind of the right foot. And the third part is going to be um, mobile do's and don'ts. Uh, and uh, so let's just uh, jump right in. Okay, first, uh, Rehu, again, like I just said, I'm the director of app services at TapJoy. And uh, I've been a game designer for about eight years. Uh, some of these companies you may recognize, uh, Hive 7, which is now part of Playdom, uh, Play First, uh, GSN, and now at TapJoy. And uh, I've worked on uh, platforms from PC, mobile, Facebook, uh, board and card games as well is where I got my start. And uh, I've worked on uh, several things you may recognize. Uh, original IP like Knighthood, which was one of the first big Facebook games with millions of users worldwide and uh, a lot of press and stuff. You may have seen it a few times on um, G4 TV as well, uh, Candy Kingdom slots, and as well as branded IP like Chocolatier, Wedding Dash Bash, and Wheel of Fortune. I uh, relaunched Wheel of Fortune for the Facebook audience uh, for GSN as well as other uh, IPs. I didn't want to crowd it too much with logos because we've seen, I don't know how many logos we've all seen at this, uh, this convention. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I said I've been a uh, game designer for going on eight years now, uh, professionally. So hopefully that's enough to convince you to listen to me for the next two parts. So here's some of my general game design lessons. Um, I've broken into uh, ignition, distillation, and execution. Now one of the first uh, questions I get quite often from uh, beginning de developers is, where do I start? And the first thing I always do is I start with this guy, and I forget him. Uh, many of us come as, as game designers, we come from a background of, uh, say, RPG gaming or designing maps and levels for, like, your uh, kind of homeland games, like Counter-Strike and that sort of thing. And it really instills an us versus them attitude towards users. And I see that a lot in uh, Facebook games uh, and PC download games as well as mobile games where a lot of the game designers seem like they're trying to show off and make a game too difficult and not enjoyable. Uh, for players because it makes them happy. It shows kind of how clever they are. And we need to get rid of that, uh, that, that attitude and make sure that you always put uh, the players first. They're the ones that are going to make your reputation. They're the ones that are going to give you money. They're the ones that are going to tell their friends about the game. You need to kind of check your ego out uh, at the door and focus on the player experience because too many uh, game designers don't do that. Uh, distillation, uh, what am I doing? The first uh, step after you get rid of kind of your own ego put to the side is distill your vision down to one sentence if you can. If you can't describe your game in one sentence, then neither can the bloggers and neither can uh, the people that are going to tell other people about your game. For instance, uh, birds of various powers destroy pigs to save their eggs in physics-based puzzles. We all know what that is, right? How about expand your village and lead your clan to victory over the goblin hordes? Clash of clans. Struggle with moral dilemmas as you fight your way through the zombie apocalypse. Walking Dead. What all these games have in common, they're all very successful, and it can all be distilled down to one sentence. And establish your scope. One of the, uh, once you have your vision, um, the tricky bit is making your vision fit within the scope of your resources. Resources are everything from the number of engineers you have, the, the marketing budget you have, the number of artists you have, the time frame, whether it's an IP or non-IP, if you're trying to make something original, et cetera, make sure that your vision and your scope, what you can actually uh, execute, match very well. Uh, third thing, before you even get started, before you put pen to paper, uh, define success. And that's not just we want to make a million dollars on this app in one day uh, at launch. Um, as you're going through uh, the process, there are many benchmarks that you need to think about, uh, such as uh, A-B testing prototypes and figuring out what is going to be your measure of success every step of the way. Now execution, how do I start? How do I do it? Uh, the first step in execution is commitment. Making sure everybody in the team uh, is invested in the vision, understands their scope, and knows where you're going, how fast and how hard. Uh, Establish routine. Um, I'm one of the worst people when it comes to meetings. I don't like meetings. I don't like sitting in, in a big room with a lot of people with maybe two of them having to be there and there's ten people kind of sitting around. I've lost so many good ideas to meetings I can't even begin to tell you. Um, but 
they're necessary. A uh, routine to check in with your team and make sure everyone's hitting milestones and everyone is actually doing what they're supposed to be doing uh, is critical. I've seen too many projects that are good ideas, that have a good vision, a good mechanic, a good kind of con conception die because they're just giving free reign. And before you know it's over budget, it's over time, and it's canceled. I've seen four really good concepts die on the vine because of uh, a lack of structure. Uh, momentum wins. Uh, I, like I said, uh, I've seen four really good game concepts die because they couldn't, they weren't kept to schedule. They were given too much freedom. The, the teams were able to run wild. They didn't hit their, uh, their milestones, and none were really established, so they died out. But games that have milestones, that have goals that you can hit, they can celebrate and then build from, um, really will keep your team moving forward and happy and re is really great for morale. So um, that's kind of how you get started. Uh, if I can... If my talk was another hour, I would talk about pre-production. I would talk about how to get uh, artists to uh, kind of go along the lines of the vision, how to, how to budget, how to manage your resources. And unfortunately, I just don't have uh, that amount of time to go into it, but I'd be happy to answer questions regarding that uh, later. Uh, now we're going to go specifically to mobile game design pit traps. And I've split that into a few different sections uh, called load it, see it, learn it, hear it, and love it. Now load it. Have a small initial download. This was touched on earlier, I think, in the uh, iMobi talk. Um, having a small initial download is critical. Don't ask users to wait. Uh, waiting is just death. Like, there's no point. It doesn't matter how good your game is. It doesn't matter how compelling or original or how strong the IP is. If they have to wait five or ten minutes for it to download, they're never going to see it. They're never going to get invested in it and just won't care. Now these are some numbers on the Android network, or for Android from the TapJoy network that we pulled. Uh, download 0 to 50 megs on our network, 50 to 60% conversion rate, 50 to 100, 30 to, 30 to 45, 100 plus, uh, 14 to 20%. Um, if only 14% of the people that go through the trouble to find, discover, and uh, tap to install your game actually open it, then you're not going to win. Uh, how can that affect monetization? Let's take a look. Let's say you had a $100,000 a month uh, advertising budget for the network, and you put a 10 cent bid, you get a million users a month, and your profit is, say, just a nickel per user on, a on average. That's the difference between the conversion rates are between being under $3 million and being under $9 million. So what that means is if you go back and you look at the um, conversion rates at 50% compared to 14%, this is the difference in your profit. So it's a very real thing you need to think about is your, your download rate. If you're at 52 megs, get it under 50. If you're at 105, get it under 100. It's, wor it's worth the uh, engineering effort to get it under those benchmarks. Because as you can see, um, I don't know about you, but I'd rather make 9 million than 3 million. Uh, use your loading screens effectively and don't waste them. I've seen some very bad examples um, for, um, for loading screens. You want to put your best foot forward, show good visuals, show something compelling and interesting, add tips and tricks, upsell the world, show people the kind of awesomeness you've put into it. You've put a lot of thought and effort into building this game. Show them while they wait for it to load what they had to look forward to. For instance, Gun Brothers 2. There's a lot of subtlety in this loading screen that um, kind of affects users on a subconscious level. You have Two guys are obviously the Gun Brothers, but the subtle parts of it is you have this big kind of wasteland part of it that you understand. Okay, you set the scene for the world, but also if you look at their guns, which are huge and also and very prominent, you notice that they're different guns. That implies that in the game, I can acquire different weapons. I can build up my character. They're wearing different armor as well. Same same deal. It's a subconscious urging to uh, towards collection. Soulcraft, another good example. Loading bar shows you how long you have to wait. Beautiful beauty shot, and it's very inspiring to the user. And a spot at the top for messaging. Clash of Clans, uh, a loading bar, and it shows off all the different unit types in the game. Again, it's aspirational. These are all the people that I can, I can be, I can, I can unlock, and I can learn to play. There's a loading bar so you know how long to wait. There's a spot for tips and a logo. And also, they're all doing something very cool. They're not just kind of standing there like, look at me. Now, don't do this. If I told you what game that was, um, you wouldn't believe me. 
this is just a blank black screen with a little loader in the, in the middle. And this really shows your user that you just don't care. And same with this. If I told you what game that was, you wouldn't believe me. Missed opportunity to upsell, to show your specials in the store, to show a cool beauty shot, a new unit that's come out. Just don't do this. Um, especially don't do it with that kind of 1986 font that no one like looks. I mean, it's, it's one step above Comic Sans, but barely. And it's a missed opportunity. Now learn it. Include a clear tutorial. Not that. Poor tutorialization is a killer. Um, I spent a lot of time doing uh, a lot of optimization of tutorials. Um, you want to uh, tie it to quest and achievements if you can. Give, give players a very real reward for completing uh, steps in the tutorial. Clear instructions. Uh, show them what to do. Don't tell them. Just tell them what to do. Long list of written instructions are no good. Keep it short and sweet. Uh, intersperse rewards into the tutorial to keep them going and motivated and happy. Uh, again, show, don't tell. A lot of it, use, use arrows, take them step by step. Don't just expect them to read a bunch of, of text and go to the next page and remember what they read. Don't do this. I've been, uh, I was going to put up uh, a whole bunch of tutorials, but really this one kind of says it all. Um, ton of teeny tiny text, that's four point type. Um, and four steps that you're expected to read and then remember once you leave the page and then a link to a video on how to play the game. If your game is too, so complicated that you need to, to take the user out of the game to YouTube to learn to play it, they need to reevaluate one, the complexity of the game and two, how you're presenting it. Because that is um, very difficult to pull off to go watch a movie, they remember everything from that movie and then go play the game and have a good experience. Uh, hear it. Uh, make a real audio effort. There's been uh, so many games I've played where the audio is repetitive and boring. Don't skip on the audio. Audio is a very real part of the experience in, in the mobile world. We've gone through so much trouble to uh, include audio. Uh, take advantage of it. Use it. Um, check your download size. If, you're, if you want to stay on the 50 megabyte download size and your download is 35 megs, invest in 10 megs of that into audio. It's worth the effort. Um, vet the audio. Don't just send it out to one person, uh, outsource it, have them make all the audio and be like, okay, that's okay. Ask other people, uh, people around you. There's probably 10 people in this room that have very strong opinions on audio. Find them and get their opinion on it as well. Um, give people choices. This is something that drives me crazy. You have a, a game and you're playing it and you love the game, uh, but there's like three or four sounds in the game and you're tired of hearing those same three or four sounds in the game. But if I have my iTunes playing or my radio in, in Google or Pandora playing, as soon as I start the game, it's shut off. And I have to hear the same four sounds over and over and over again. Um, let people, if they have their own audio playing, let them listen to their own audio. Okay? Because uh, audio burnout is a very real thing, especially in casino games. Uh, don't leave it till the end. Develop. As soon as a, a feature is locked in and finalized, go to the audio track and start developing the audio along with it. What you'll find is the audio will help you define um, some of the flavor and style and feel of the game as you go. Uh, single loops. Oh, sorry, single loops are one of the worst. Uh, casino games you do this a lot where they'll have a, casino, have a slot machine and it'll be the same sound over and over and over. It doesn't matter if you win, if you lose, there'll be no payoff on the audio. Um, very bad idea. It really kills retention uh, in terms of having to hear the same sound over and over and over again. It doesn't take a lot of investment of time to vary the audio, either the, the, the speed or multiple clips, or one long clip that's cut and, and only pieces of it are, are, are played. So there are tips and tricks for uh, audio people that can give you a lot of bang for your buck for, for audio. Now, love it. Give positive feedback as soon as you possibly can to, uh, to players. Uh, so too many games save uh, rewards, like leveling up uh, to, to late in the game. Um, don't delay the gratification. Let them, as soon as they start playing, give them some reward and show them the progress that they can make uh, in the game. And make them, it'll, it'll make them happier early on and will really help your uh, retention and in the long run help your monetization as well. Now, if you look at these two charts, I'll kind of decipher them for you. The game on the left is a very popular uh, rumor to be uh, over $1 million a day game. This is their leveling chart over time. On the right, 
as a game that is not quite as successful. And I've uh, removed the names of the game to protect the innocent or the, and the not so innocent. And what you'll see is over 100 minutes, you'll get to level 9. Within the first one to three or so levels, or uh, levels, it takes very, very little, bit, little time. So in minutes one to five, you get to level two or three. That's three points where, within the first five minutes, where you can give them a reward, show them, hey, you've unlocked this new thing. You've, you've gone up in power, you've gained in, in stats, etc. You've unlocked a new unit, you've unlocked a new building, whatever it may be. On the, the game on the right, minutes one through five, you're still at level zero. Minutes six to 15, still level zero. Minutes 16 to 100, eh, somewhere in there you're gonna get to level two. So what you're asking is a player to invest, who knows nothing about your game beyond what they've looked and whatever led to the discovery, to invest 15 or 16 minutes, maybe more, before they get any sort of positive feedback from you. And that's bad. You're not going to retain that user. They can get frustrated before they even get close to finishing that. So what we have here on the left-hand side is multiple opportunities within that kind of sweet spot of engaging user of one in one to three minutes of two to three times of being able to say, hey, Good job, you're doing, you're doing great. Keep going, keep moving. And that's very, very important. Um, that was going to help your attention. There's a reason this game has multiple millions of users, and that one has about five figures of users. And uh, to make matters even worse, that game is an IP that has a brand behind it, and they can't break six figures of users. So that's really um, all I had to say for right now, because I really wanted to get a lot of questions uh, from the audience, because I find we learn more from the questions. Um, here's my contact information. If you have any questions we can't get to, feel free to tweet them to me. I'll be paying attention to Twitter for the next hour or so. Um, there's my Twitter up there. You can reach me at my Tapjoy email address. Tapjoy.com has a lot of our articles and stuff for you, and my personal website is geekgamerguide.com, where you can read my blogs about the uh, transit problems of the Bay Area and general game stuff. Nice work. Well, thanks, Ray. Um, my dev team's definitely going to have a, a meeting as soon as I arrive uh, into the office on Tuesday just to cover a couple of these points. Uh, I enjoyed that. So anybody else uh, have any comments or feedback or questions about some of the, the dev suggestions that Ray's laid out for us? You guys knew all of that. You're the perfect game developers. It's a, it's a bright crowd here, I've noticed. <laughs> If you have any questions, I will oh, be... Oh, oh there's oh, a question. Question oh, over there. Hello. Run, run, run. It's only 3.30. You can't be that tired yet. Over here. Where? You have a question? Oh, there. That's the hand. Sorry about that. No, I'm, I'm just curious. Do you, do you kind of prescribe it all to the lean startup methodology? And when you think about your development process, do you, is there any, before you jump into some of the great, great suggestions on development, but is there anything you do kind of in the iterative process early on regarding, you know, just concept testing or, you know, light focus groups to see whether the concept even resonates or before you even get started on, you know, spending that first dollar? Um, absolutely. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of uh, Agile in terms of full app development. But at the beginning, uh, absolutely vet your idea. If you have the resources to do market research, uh, ab absolutely. And also, there is ad hoc research you can do. You can look at uh, in the app stores and th through anal ba analytics ba uh, basically available to everybody. You can see the popularity of genre and game style right, right from the get-go. Um, the tricky part is when you're trying to do market research or you're trying to vet an idea is writing the questions in such a way that you don't lead the, uh, the audience in the direction you want them to, get to, to go. I've seen too many um, surveys, say, uh, for, uh, for a, a game that basically lead the, uh, the survey taker in a direction that the company would like them to go. There are companies out there that will do this uh, for you where you'll explain to them the game concept and they will write kind of more neutral questions and put them in a, in a form where you can actually get useful data. I definitely prescribe to, if you, if you have the resources, Try to vet an idea, a, a concept, even a mechanic, if, if you have the resources to, to do so, before going to full scale. Once you commit to an idea and a vision, though, I, I don't really um, like the agile process of developing a whole product. I believe you should have a, a vision. Uh, if you only make 10% of a product and throw it out there and, and test it, you're only going to get 10% of the feedback you should get for the full thing. Um, 
but at the same time, I, I understand that there are limitations with uh, resources, et cetera. Uh, I much prefer once a, a vision is put down and tested and vetted that you go and actually kind of plot it out uh, very, uh, very firmly and execute on that. Is that helpful? And uh, if you buy me more than two or more drinks, I will tell you specific, that specific example that I alluded to vaguely. Uh, nice. Is there definitely any other questions? Uh, yeah, I definitely want to hear who the, uh, the, the innocent games who just protected their identity were. That one is uh, four drinks. Ah. OK, question over here. I'd like to hear more about uh, your take on input and interaction optimizing for mobile. Optimization for, mo optimization for mobile. Um, I am a strong proponent of, of metrics, but I'm not a very strong proponent of data-driven design. If you're starting your game with an Excel spreadsheet and trying to build fun around it, that's one thing. But wait, do you want to clarify? clarify? I meant uh, input. Oh, for like, like, like tap versus swipe, um, like actual uh, UI, UX, that, that kind of thing. Um, super challenging in, uh, in mobile because uh, you're, you're fighting with your, your thumbs for screen space to show actually the cool thing that, that you've, you've thought of. Um, I think uh, there's kind of two points to that. One is I think there's an opportunity on the hardware side to rectify that that isn't being met, but uh, we'll see some movement on that soon based on what I saw at VDC. Uh, and two, um, when, I get, when I talked earlier about complexity and, and that sort of thing, uh, about a singular, singular uh, vision for game design, um, UI and UX should be taking into account for that. If you're making a game that you think is going to take five or six nested menus to operate uh, efficiently, then you need to kind of maybe take a, st take a step back. Uh, one of the mistakes I've, uh, I've often seen is UI and UX is thought about as an afterthought, that mechanics are designed and cool things are, are, are thought of and stories are written without any I idea on how to, say, make a character walk from left to right side of the screen. Like art has already done concepts that show all this really cool stuff, but no thought is given to where to put, say, a, a thumbstick or, or that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of um, tilt control because it's, it's not fine enough, I, I don't think. It's either not fine enough or way too fine. So people, it, it frustrates people, but that, that'll get there. Um, UI and UX and interaction needs to be thought of like really from the beginning, especially if you're making a game that's like an action game or a game where um, screen tapping or interaction on the screen is critical to success in the game. Like for a word game, it's not that big of a deal, but for an action game or a shoot or something like that, uh, it's very challenging right now because the hardware is not addressing it. We don't have slide out keyboards for, uh, for Android or, or iPhone that can accommodate touch pads or um, finger controls, that sort of thing. Um, so my answer to you is it's super challenging. Uh, it's very difficult. And I'd be more than happy to, to uh, talk to you about it a little bit more um, later, because there's a couple things that will take like five minutes to explain <laughs> in terms of uh, positive and negative. And some things I've seen here, actually, that are, are very cool. Not sure if that even helps. <laughs> Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I'm Jacob, uh, Pocket Play Lab from Thailand. Since you are from Tapjar doing advertising as well, what are some of your best practices for actually integrating advertising in a way that you will monetize high but still not annoy the user out of the actual flow of getting into the game? Oh, there's, a, there's a few things that can uh, uh, help with that. One is, uh, as a Tapjar partner, you have access uh, well, to me, <laughs> or I can help you actually go through your game and make suggestions on that. My, my primary responsibility there is to review and vet games and help developers um, avoid the pit traps uh, of that. Um, one of the earlier speakers kind of hit one a nail on the head where a ad on load is one of the fastest ways to kill your, your game retention. If the, ga the game is loading and here's an ad for another game, um, players are going to jump out. Um, another speaker talked about how uh, many games are, are installed, only opened once, and, and then people leave. That's one of the main reasons people leave and only open an app once, it's because the first thing they see is an ad for another game. Um, the second thing is um, use an ad network that, and preferably Tapjoy, and that's who I'm with, um, that is going to um, share data with you. We, we actually have a whole, I have a whole slide deck I can share with you on best practices for implementing ad, ads. I can share with, with anybody that, that's interested um, that kind of shows some of the pitfalls and do's and don'ts of implementation of, of ads. And in addition, like I said, if you, if you go with Tapjoy, I'll be there to, to help you uh, every step of the way. Any good examples of titles you can name? 
I mean, that puts me in a very difficult position because if I say a game, then uh, I will hear from 10 other developers asking why I didn't say their game. If I say a negative example, um, uh, I'll get that developer um, angry at me. Um, see me after. I'll give you two free beers outside. <laughs> <laughs> two free beers and I'll, and I'll tell you outside. Awesome. That was great. Oh, uh, can we do one more if it's quick? One more if it's quick. Oh, hi. I'm just out of curiosity about uh, the, um, your experience with training the young game designer. Like, uh, especially now, we have the debate about the uh, game designer who have purely creation and passion for game, and the one who is purely mathematical and science and data driven. So, do you have any experience or sharing the success case of one good game designer that you trained? My, uh, my recommendation is make them work together. Um, I, don't, I don't see game design as an art or a science. I see it as a fusion of both. It's more alchemical. If you're purely data-driven, if you're starting from a spreadsheet and trying to make fun out of it, um, very rarely are you going to hit it. If you're a guy that doesn't care about the math, um, then you're missing out on a huge part of, of the actual experience, and you're going to actually cost your company a lot of money because your game may be cool, the mechanic may be original and interesting, but it will be implemented.